Hello, everyone. This is J.D. Calderon, and this is Indie Comics Explained. And yet again, I brought another fantastic group of independent comic book creators. Please hit like, hit subscribe, share the video, let everybody know we're here. And without further ado, let me bring this guy on. Good evening. No? Yeah? No? Maybe? Yeah. Okay. I would I would have hoped, you know, that you, you would give me a cheap little pop for that at least, you know? But... Uh, <laughs> I'll keep it. I'll keep it moving. What's up, Streamland? Welcome. Thank you again for hanging out with all of us tonight. I'm Jay Rosario from Unstoppable Comics, hanging out with this guy over here, talking to a bunch of talented creators who are putting their money where their mouth is, have a ton of credits, and are willing to share some of their experiences and new projects with you. All right, cool. Nice, I'm Randy, I'm bringing you in oh. as the uh, involuntary, voluntary uh, co-co-host. There you go. Co-co-host. Uh oh, you, you, I was going to ask. I, I hope you don't upgraded. expect me to make up a question out of the blue. But I, <laughs> I, uh, I think I, I don't make up it. questions. I think I could do it. <laughs> hey, folks, I'm Randy Zimmerman. You can find my work over at ArrowComics.store. I've been doing Arrow Comics off and on since about the mid '80s. I've done uh, such works as Tales from the Anniverse, Spank the Monkey, War of the Worlds, and currently. Uh, Working on a bunch of other things, including the Shadow Kingdom with the great Russ Leach and the Fool. And uh, uh, right now, hopefully over at aerocomics.store, you can pick up a copy of Alice in Chains by myself and Abdul Rashid. Very it's a nice. great, it's, it's, it's a friendly little book. You can tell by the cover. Yeah. A, a, a little horrific about a girl who breaks out of her test tube and, and breaks out of her lab in order to uh, find freedom. Nice. Yeah. And right. while being able to shoot chains out of the palms of her hands at the same time. It's a friendly book. Like it. Yeah. I like it. Hey. Hello. Yeah, introduce yourself. Hello. Hi, I'm Jeff Haas. I am the writer creator of um, The End of All Terminus, which the second issue is now on Kickstarter. Um, please back it. Um, I don't know if that's pitching too soon, but back it. Um, I'm also a uh, podcaster of the Traverse of the Stars podcast. Uh, watch it. And also a publicist. So uh, hire me. Too. So there it is. Pitch my way in all three different categories. There, we are. 30 seconds. there you go. All, <laughs> That's right. all right, we can shut down the show. We don't have to go anymore. We already <laughs> done it all. <laughs> How you doing, Madeline? Please introduce yourself. Okay, sure. Um, you have to excuse my voice. I've had really bad allergies, so my voice is kind of doing this. Um, anyway, I'm Madeline Holly Rosing. I'm the writer creator of the Steampunk Supernatural series, Boston Metaphysical Society. And we currently have a Kickstarter running for our very first hardback of Volume One. Nice, awesome. Like Somebody you. shaving. <laughs> <laughs> the background noise. That's all right. Oh yeah. I'll just add to uh, the transparency. This is true. This is true. All right, and, and, and we, and, you know, just by the, the skin of her teeth, Christy. Oof. There she is. There she is. Christy. Hey, Christy. Hey. How are you? Up? Oh, Good. I got stuck in LA traffic. You know how it is. Yeah. Need to look at camera two. There you are. <laughs> oh, the other the other camera. There you go. So Christy, please introduce yourself. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Well, I'm the creator of Demon Bitch, uh, about a low-level demon from the 13th pit of hell where people throw their dog shit in gum wrappers. And she wants me the second coming of Armageddon, but the first one never happened because she's a stupid asshole. She's based on girls I hate or just people I despise. And I'm also the president of the Comic Art Professional Society by some fucking grace of God or whatever the hell that is. But um, there I run things. So, And I also am running uh, an event upcoming for Free Comic Book Day first uh, week called Asian Invasion Celebrating Asian Creators. So if they're anything like me, God help the world. Nice. Now, yeah. I, Chris, you real quick, how many of those characters are based on Jay? <laughs> oh, all of them. Totally. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I love what Christie's on because it makes my foul mouth seem tame. You know what I'm saying? I could run it off, but Christy gives me a great run for my money. I, I mean, she's oh, spitting yeah. gold out there sometimes. She's making up new curse words, you know, right off the cuff. And you got to appreciate somebody like that. Well, you know, being on the West Coast, some of the people on the East Coast kind of gave me like new words to think about. So I, I'd say that's like I'm all domestic. <laughs> And I'm international as well, so there you go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. All right, so so look, we got the show question. You know, there's been a lot of drama lot of going drama. on. Say, there's been what? a lot of drama going on. So, you know, I'm I'm tired of it. I I did a bunch of streams this week about it. So there you are. The show question is: 
what can we do to make a better comic uh, indie comic book industry like what what can we do what, what can we do better for our community you know how can we make things better for one another you know ultimately that's what we're looking for right peace um, of mind personally just treat them like the assholes that they are i mean now people might think oh that means you have to get in their face oh you mean have to do this oh you mean have to do that no it's just treat it like the asshole on the street like just go away to like let me see is my time weighed much more effectively to engage with this person or scrubbing my toilet eating corn chips? And by the way, I hate fucking corn chips. So you kind of use that assessment of your time spent. There are sometimes you have to tell the person to go screw themselves and to fuck off and fall off the planet. Two other times you just ignore them and say, eh, just go, go away. Or sometimes you have to go legal and report them to the needed agencies. I've had to do all of the above and it's not one set plan you just have to match measure per measure that's it yeah it's it's always a case by case basis yeah um i mean i guess my suggestion would be um we'd be like to say the unique comic book community but we need to actually be a community um i think sometimes we all think we're a thousand different boats trying to reach shore when we're really one big boat with a bunch of rooms inside it and i think the idea is that the better we work together and, and not, and we're not, I mean, at our level, we're not really competitors for each other. There, we're not, none of us are making such a large percentage of the market to be um, competitors like Marvel and DC and stuff like that um, for each other. So I think it's more of a, a case of determining, are you in it alone or are you in the community? I think that's the difference. All right, cool. Uh, Madeline, you have anything to add to that? Cause I know you just, you said something. Yeah, I mean, you, oh, you yeah, gave well, your I, opinion. I, but... I mean, I, I agree with, with Christy. It's a case by case basis. Um, but I, I think what we do need to do is, is define better. Um, mm -hmm. what do you mean by better? Uh, you know, a better, uh, working community, um, you know, helping each other level up with our craft, um, or all of the above. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for myself, I mean, all of the above. Right now, uh, like, you know, <clears throat> over the last week, I've seen a lot of people screaming and yelling at each other. And it's one of those things where it's just a lot of young men acting, I, I don't want to say acting out of sorts, but, you know, just getting out of character as far as I'm concerned, because I think they're all good guys. They just are not getting along. And I don't think there's a, there's no try to, there's no meeting of the minds when it comes down to them. They're not even trying. <laughs> you know, they're just screaming at one another. And they're just like, I'm like, guys, like, you you know, you, 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 it's all words on Twitter. It doesn't mean anything. You know, you can walk away. You can just go touch grass, go take a deep breath, go read a good book, go do something, but don't do this. You know? Well, um, yeah, there's, there's always a better choice. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I mean, let me be really frank about it. I mean, I've had a kind of a couple of very big epiphanies in the last few years with people like that. This is what separates the winners from the losers. Are you going to go and get into a bunch of petty shit and a bunch of petty fights and go whine and piss about something? Or are you actually going to go and put your head together to form a logical and possibly a very real complaint? Now, people, when you bitch, it's like, okay, there is a legitimate thing happening here. There is a legitimate wrong. But how do you voice it without looking more stupid? And nobody really thinks that. It's like, I just got to say something. Okay, good. You got to say something. And it's probably very important. Mm -hmm. But voice it in a way that actually gives you dignity and not this crap. I mean, that's the thing that really boils down to it. And it's like, it, it's sort of like this, like, would you tell your mother this type of shit to her face in this way? No, probably not. And if you want to, it's like better to be logical and polite or take a moment formulate your thing and come back later when you have everything solved, figured out in your head. And the thing is people don't do that. They just want to go and respond. They want to say a bunch mm -hmm. of shit because they want to go and wave their fucking dick on the keyboard, which is really stupid. I mean, people get mad at me about like using somewhat semi archaic things. Oh, well, too bad. Um, but at cer a certain point of time, it's like, do you really have to give a fuck about certain things? No, you don't. I mean, you can have your feelings about it, but is this worth giving a fuck about? This is what I've learned in my life. Like, I've been hurt. I've been upset. I've been angry about things. But I just got to sit down. And sometimes there are times I'm just like, you know, in the long run, I really don't give a fuck about this. I don't care. And it's not like this fake, I don't care where I sh shove my feelings down. It's more of like, okay, I'm angry and hurt. And I 
this is how I care. But, you know, do I really care enough to really say anything? Not like, oh, well, nobody's going to tell me or no. no. If you're coming from the position of like, you know, I really don't care about this. All right. And then you can move on. But you have to come to that point personally. <clears throat> CJ, that's how you're supposed to handle the situation. OK. Anyway, Randy, how do you feel about it? Well, I've been pretty quiet about this whole thing. <clears throat> but uh, that, and on top of some of the other stuff that's happened in the in the comics media the last couple of days and mm -hmm. you know there's there's a lot of passion in this industry and uh i am really a, a a hair splitter when it comes to words and terms and you have to decide if we're going to be a community or an industry if you're going to be a community a community it has an hoa in it it has gladys kravitz across the street constantly measuring your bushes and looking in your windows and trying to find all the little petty stuff that you're not supposed to be doing. An industry is out there working. My big thing is what happened, especially to Ed, is a solid tragedy. Uh, just the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst. And it's a shame that Ed couldn't have stood up when he wrote the, the his note and everybody everybody out there should read that note you have to read that note it because it's ed's side of the story i wish ed had stood up and said what he said in his note and not had it end as tragically for himself as as it did because that that's the you know his side of the story and there's always as they they said i think on babylon 5 the, the truth is a three-edged sword. There's their side, there's your side, and then there's the truth. So, but but to me, especially lately, these last few years with the polarization going on and all of this crap, I keep telling folks, you have to decide if you want to be in a community or an industry. I want to be in an industry, so I'm sitting here working. You know, social, those social platforms aren't social. They're just not. And a lot of it just breeds hate. And you have to know basically you have to mind your manners know how know how to be nice and understand that anything that you say on the web has, is read by the world whether it's a direct communication or not it's the way it, it's the way it works mind your manners uh and and if you're going to talk to friends and we have friends in this industry help them mm -hmm. you know and and also the big thing that i i push on my podcast is try to be positive you have to go out there and talk positively about this industry show your passion in, in an upward scale, you find a comic that you love, tell people you found a comic that you love. You know, not a comic that sucks or this guy is this or that guy votes that way or whatever. Stop it. Just stop it. And work and do this. This is a beautiful fan. You see, you're getting me started. It's a beautiful, fantastic art form. And we need to be out there as artists and understand, yeah, there, there's we're all artists. We're all passionate. We all have our emotions. But there's a time, you know, there's a time and place for all of this stuff. And the net, Twitter, wherever, spouting hate isn't, isn't going to make it. It's not, not helpful for anybody. Gives you a small dopamine hit that you have to chase after af over and over and over again. But for the most part, it, it doesn't show the passion and it doesn't help this industry. And you should be out there working every day to help this industry. That's that's what I feel. All right, cool. Uh, Jay, what are your thoughts? All right, uh, on the thoughts of the Ed stuff, I mentioned this last night for anybody who wasn't there. Um, I'm not going to condone any of the actions pre or post. Um, I wasn't there. You know, I, I can't take anything out of context. Because uh, um, I don't understand the full situation other than the guy was in pain and he was in so much pain. Um, he couldn't see, you know, any helping hands that are out there. So if anybody is thinking about, um, um, you know, making that ultimate decision, uh, put it up last night, the suicide hotline number is 988, 988. Um, give somebody a talk, you know, uh, as, as someone who is a, a family survivor of that situation, um, it's, it's fucking difficult. Um, picking up the pieces afterwards. When it comes to the immature people uh, out there, and pretty much that's it, right? Um, it's it's folks that haven't grown up, right? Um, it's it's what happens when you 
when you take money out of the education system. It's uh, what happens when you give eighth place trophies to people out there. Um, you know, and they're gonna cry and 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 just talk bullshit, right? Until they get noticed, right? Um, they think the squeaky wheel um, is the one that gets the oil all the time, and no, it's not. It's usually the one that gets replaced. Um, how many jobs do they know? How many bookings um, are they not going to get? How many bookings have they cost their associates um, or people in their circle? You know, it, it, as a New Yorker, uh, the 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 uh, phrase "stay in your lane" keep keeps you know chiming in my head, man. You know, um, I'm sorry. Shut the fuck up and do your work. Plain and simple. If you were if you were really focusing on your craft or your creative journey or whatever you want to call it, you'd be too busy to engage in any of this bullshit that's online. You really would. I mean, uh, and and just forget about it. You know, um, the people that are doing their work are leveling up, and they will be shining, shining. Um, and unfortunately, those other folks out there will always be jealous of anybody making moves better than them. So if they're not talking about person A, they're going to be talking about person B tomorrow. Right. Um, Calderon, Randy, you and I were, we were involved in a situation mm -hmm. that went deep and went deep and mm -hmm. um, emotionally and, and financially, emotionally and financially. Yeah. And you guys know, I suffered the pain. Mm -hmm. with you guys on that um but i wasn't out there on the streams right I, I i don't know maybe it's the old school um in me but it's like you know you, you never let them know what's going on behind closed doors well right? for for that that was us that coming was out and, and, and voicing it it was, was a different situation but i, I and i get yeah. that but you know there's also a certain amount of embarrassment tarnished yeah uh, um, um that comes with it. And I just, yeah. I didn't want that. I mean, I already had that. I didn't want, you know, I didn't want more of that out there. Mm -hmm. um, and just the petty back and forths. You guys already know, you know, the phone calls that we had in our group meetings and how bad, how toxic that was. And I didn't want to expose that anymore than it already had been. Um, again, mm -hmm. I just feel it's a sign of maturity. You don't need to go shouting, oh my God, this person said this about me. The fuck it doesn't matter it really doesn't matter move on move on yeah. right and if you look at most of these people's credits they probably got a book or two to their name all right all right that's fair listen my thing is uh trying to treat everybody try to treat one another the way the old saying goes treat everyone the way you want to be treated right yeah. that's the main tenet you know mm -hmm. if you want to be treated well treat everyone else well and that and that's basically the way I look at it. It is like show some compassion and do your work. Yeah. You know, because in the end, you know, Jay said something funny yesterday. He was just like, oh, yeah. You know, he says making comic books is easy. I'm like, no, it's not. You know, making a good comic is hard. It's no, hard. no, no. I, you just, now you're taking that out of context. Too making too making, making the comic late. book is the easy part. No, it that's isn't. the easy part. No, as hard isn't. as it is. No, as hard as it is, not. that's the easy no, part. Of course it is. No, it isn't. Of course no, it, it is. Isn't. Making Stop. a good comic, it, it, making a good comic is it. is the hardest thing you'll ever do. Come on, making bro. a good comic is the hardest thing you'll ever do. Promoting it, well, listen. Now I know why you got all that chimps, free time. We don't chimp, know chimps can, chimps can listen. People can promote. <laughs> we, we hire people who 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 that's all they can do, or that's all they do can promote. You understand? But they can't do a good comic. Doing a good comic, doing what Alan Moore did, doing what Frank Miller did, doing the things that <clears throat> I hope everyone is aspiring to do, those things are not easy. Making those level of comics, that's not easy. You understand? Selling it, I will always say that's second fiddle. Okay. You know? Okay. That's always second fiddle. Because the thing is, I can hire somebody to sell my book. You understand? I can't hire somebody to do my book for me. I have to do that for myself. That's That is incredibly difficult. You know, making a good one. Chris, you just want to make a comic, feel free. Chris, he has a point. <clears throat> I would say keeping your vision with sheer persistence, because everybody's going to tell you, don't do it. You're wrong. You are screwed up. You are messed up, whatever. 
and you know what if your gut tells you to go do it you be fucking persistent in that and you know eventually people will see it your way and you don't have to be a dickhead to do it mm -hmm. personally i mean as i said going back let's go touch on the Ed pisker thing what pissed me off was is that people just jumped on to jump on yeah. that was really fucking gross yeah. to me yeah. um they didn't care if a crime had actually been done or if anything really happened they just did it to do it and then now i see those fuckers going and deleting their posts and say Oh, but we were really always like liking him. I'm like, go oh, fuck off. Right. So, I mean, for me, it's that whole thing for show, this whole thing for clout. And it's like, wow, you have to go and go so deep and so low to go for attention. There's better ways to get attention. And you just showed us yourselves how much of asses you are. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't have respect for that at all. I mean, you just keep uh, doing uh, thing. Jay, who, who's high five comics? I don't know, but they got my back. What's up, high okay. five? I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> Thank you. I gotta invite them on the show and see how many. Invite them. <laughs> invite what them, they've baby. done. <laughs> <laughs> more than happy to argue this. I'm, I'm more than happy to argue that that point. Um, <clears throat> Jay, anyway, it's your, it's your turn. I I heard you took my question. Turn. You took my question. I, I had. I only have <laughs> one for the night, and you took it. That's not what was in your. Uh, how to make it better community. Get out of here. He's at NYC it? too. Oh, yeah. My man. Or, or women, whoever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> all right. Let's, let's, let's try to make things light and airy, right? Let, let's, let's be positive here for a moment. What has inspired you the most in your creative journey? Right. Very nice. Softball, easy question. Uh, could be taken from almost any different, uh, uh, part of the spectrum you choose to talk about. All right, uh, Madeline, why don't you start it off? <laughs> um, I would say the fans. Okay. I mean that it, it's been a very interesting journey with the fans, in that you know when I did the original six issue miniseries, you know that was pretty much set in stone. Uh, you know, throughout production. And but then when I was thinking, you know, what's what's going to happen next? What am I going to do next? What's going to be the next story? Uh, I remember sitting at a small co a steampunk convention down in San Diego and one of my fans was sitting at my table with me. We we're chatting and talking about a story. And she was talking about a completely different book, but I than mine. But then I realized there were certain elements that related to to Caitlin, our spirit photographer, and what was going on, and the repercussions, and just, you know, a gleaning of an idea of like, okay, the next story should be Caitlin, you know, dealing with her repercussions of mm -hmm. her actions, you know, within the context of the world that she lived in. And so, you know, it's this kind of feedback that I'll, I'll get little bits and pieces from fans and uh that are, are really inspiring to to definitely keep me going and probably the best story is when we did the audio drama after that was released um one of the gentlemen got back to me who had who had backed it and he said he has had a, a autistic teenage son and they were just going back to school and he was, they were having a really hard time. The kid wouldn't get in the car. So finally he said, Hey, I've got this new thing for you to listen to just to get him in the car so they could get home. So he started listening to the audio drama and really started enjoying it. And then they started talking about it. And then every day when he picked him up, you know, Oh, 15 nice. more minutes of this audio drama. Nice. And he said, then he wanted to read the comics. And Good. then he said, it literally changed their relationship. How many, I mean, most of the time you don't hear these stories. No one tells you how your creative endeavor affects them. And this was amazing. And so I asked him if I could share this with the cast and crew. And he said, sure. And so I did. And they're all going like, I'm not crying. I'm not crying. <laughs> but these are the, the stories and the little things that keep us going. And you have to remember that you'll probably never hear these stories. You'll probably never hear back from people of how, you know, it was a bad day. And this, this, you know, 
gave them just a little with their coffee and just to, to chill and made them feel better that day. You'll, you'll never hear that, but rest assured it happens. Yeah. So that's yeah, yeah. what keeps, that's what should keep you going because you know, somewhere out there, your work is affecting somebody. You have no idea what kind of impact you're ever going to have until you get feedback because it, and it'll come from the strangest, oddest directions and mostly unexpected. And just, and it, for me, yeah. I've, I've been doing this for 30, 40 years. It's always the stuff you think is, is, is crappy. So you have to be careful, especially in the comic market. If you, <laughs> if you put out a job, you're not especially happy with, you think it's clunky and it's not quite working right or, or whatever. That's the one the fans bring up to you and make you autograph the most. Mm -hmm. It really is that just like what Jade, what uh, JD Calderon says, when you have a, when you do a comic, it's like giving birth, you mm -hmm. know, in a way, because it, it's, it's not, you know, physically painful, hopefully, but uh, for the most part, you're putting that sweat equity in, you're thinking, you're rethinking, you're, you're overthinking most of the time what you're supposed to be doing and how it's supposed to look when you hold it in your hands, it's like holding your kid. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've I've had the the pleasure of doing both of both of those, and the to to me the emotion is is comparable, you know, uh, and and you never know where that kid's gonna go, and the yeah. the thing for me I I love uh, I teach cartooning or used to teach cartooning for the bug hit after school, and that was that that still comes back and and is rewarding to me today. People I'm walking down the street and people stop me and and tell me I took your cartooning class, you know five or six years ago and I did this or that. And there's nothing like seeing that light bulb go off in a kid's over the kid's head and have him figure out that they're that what com the power of comics, basically that they can say what they want. They can do what they want. That all they have to do is put it down on paper. You know, it, it, there's, there's no feeling like it really. Um, I would say motivated by the idea. Um, there's no better feeling than when you have something that, catches you as an idea and it doesn't let go mm -hmm. and then the more you work on it it becomes as real as you wanted it to be as good as you wanted it to be and then the whole process is, is rewarding every single time you get a page back from the artist is a good feeling i mean it, it's like it's like going to the comic book store yourself but it's your own stuff and i think it's just a increasingly rewarding experience the more and more you do it and the more you get that constant like rush of getting the new pages in and then the book is made and you get the book in um, first open up the packet with your books in it. Then someone buys your book at the convention or wherever it's, it, it's, it's, it's very rewarding. I think, and that's kind of like the inspiration is that it makes you want to do it another time and get that rush all over again. It's, yeah, it's, right. it's, it's like, it, it does become like a drug. It's a little bit of an addiction. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, is your greatest fear? Um, what would be your greatest fear? Be like having a comic book that, uh, or find that you can't do your next issue for whatever reason. It, it's that rush to that because you, you just want to keep um, wanting it. And when that issue's done, you come up with a new idea. You're scrambling for a new idea because you want the next rush of the next comic book to come out um, from you. And I think that's kind of some of the things that makes it all fun and enjoyable and worth it. Yeah. Cool. Christy, what are your thoughts? Well, it's kind of funny. You're asking somebody that admits that she writes petty mean comics about and just like draw shit about people she doesn't <laughs> like. But here, here's a point to that. The thing is, is that I don't just do it just to shit on somebody. The thing is, is like, this is stuff that's happened to me repeatedly over and over. And I've been told, you can't do anything about it. Shut up, blah, blah, blah. Yes, I have been bullied. But what did I decide to do? I decided to draw something about it. And the thing is, is I didn't draw it for the sake of shitting on it. I mean, at the first time I did, I admit it. I did it just to make myself laugh because that was my only way of dealing with it. Because people would tell me, oh, you're too nice. You're too this. Victim blaming. Now... I got out of the victim blaming thing and I just did it because it's like, you know what, this sucks and I hate it. And I had every right to say that. But the thing is, is that what I found different from mine and some people that do hate comics or anger comics or whatever, and I'm not saying all of them, but a good number of them is, is that it, I give people a space to absolve themselves of this anger. Like it's okay to be this pissed off about this shit. And the thing is, is that, you have no idea how it feels for people to be able to be given space for that. No, you shouldn't be angry. I'm not talking about just men and women, just people. And it's like, well, you're pissed. Well, you know, you're going to go out and do violent things. No, you're not. You're just really angry and you want to express that and you're that pissed off. Mm -hmm. And it gives people that space. And it's like in that very specific space of like, 
they go back and say, I really felt this when this happened to me. So it feels like it goes down deep. A lot of the comics that I do, at least from the feedback I've gotten, goes down deep and it somehow dislodges that pain and anger or whatever the fuck they felt at that time that was terrible. And it like releases it like, this is okay. And that's all they need. And they're happier about it. It's not just, oh, people are just shitty and we should go go and focus on how shitty people are and they're just all shitty. It won't ever. No, it's like, wow, this specific time really upset me on some very deep level. And now I can laugh at it because I have exposed it to the air and it can just go away. And that's like kind of how therapy is. It's like they don't need to dig down deep and go all the way and your subconscious is your enemy. It's like, oh, I didn't realize that because you have a person that's trained and who's a third person looking in and going like, oh, yeah, this, this, and this. And all you need to do is find that. Because the platitudes people say like, oh, you just need to let it go. Oh, you need That's nice. Tell me how. And that's the thing. What I got sick of is people telling me these platitudes like, oh, well, you're just letting them win if you feel upset, if you're feeling this, if you're feeling that, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, I have every right to freaking feel that way without you further victimizing me or shaming me. It's like, I have every right to do that. And the thing is, is that I think because we're shamed like that, and I don't know why, because people have this idiotic idea about like how anger should be dealt with in our society sometimes, is that now you have people that act out by suppressing long-term problems underneath. Like now sometimes, and it's not to preemptively judge people unfairly, but it's like now coming from my own experiences, when I see somebody act out, I'm like, you kind of have, like, I don't say it out loud to people, but my personal judgment is, you know, you have some deep latent problems coming from somewhere. You really need to address that before you get into it because this is kind of a cumulative thing. This is a snowballing effect. And at least for my comic, it seems like it seems to release the pressure where it goes down deep enough. Or I don't know how deep. I can't judge it with people, but from what they tell me, pretty deep, where they can just let it go because they acknowledge it. Mm-hmm. And perhaps that's how I'm making it a better world. And I know, like I say, oh, it's people I hate and everything. Well, there are some very good reasons why you might hate some people or some people that did shit to you and being told you need to forgive them and all this shit. Forgiveness is a gift. And sometimes forgiveness is just how you let it go is like, oh, I really don't need to deal with that anymore. I get it now. Whatever. I'm done processing, whatever. It's just simpler than what it sounds, but we've chosen to make it harder. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, for myself, the thing that um, I guess motivates me or inspires me is um getting lost in the world that I'm creating. I mean, um, I have an issue. <laughs> I have an issue when I sit down and I start writing. Um, I get real cranky if you disturb me because I'm usually not on the same planet as you are anymore. You know, I'm so, I'm so far gone. I mean, like someone has spoken to me while I'm in the process of writing and I have looked up. I know I'm looking at another human being and I'm like, what am I supposed to say right now? Because I'm someplace else, right? That's how far gone I am. I don't even know where I'm at. I'm like, because for me, writing is such, the process for me is so fo- hyper-focused. It's the most difficult thing I think I do. And I mean, I manage scads of people on a daily basis, right? But writing is the most difficult thing I could do. I could deal with 60 people at a time. That's easy. But when it comes down to having, you know, doing spreadsheets and all that jazz, that that's that's simple. But when I have to write a story, that that requires hyper focus, and that's the sort of thing that that I really enjoy, where I get to go someplace and just be gone, you know. And I mean, I like I said, I'm on another planet. So, and this is why I don't have to take drugs. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so Jay. Back at you. Sir. Uh, no, I wanna I wanna chime in on uh, on what Madden was saying. Definitely, it's those connections I make, you know, with the people at, at conventions more than anything else. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not on Broadway. I'm not a musician. I'm not a chef, right? So I don't get that immediate uh, reaction from somebody that's that's ingested my product, whatever it is, whether it's you know my performance, my song, my food. Um, takes a while to put this stuff together so when when you know we're at a I'm at a convention and they're coming back or they were looking forward to seeing me from you know the last year that I was there or they they got a, uh, a project for me on Kickstarter that they were like oh my god I couldn't wait to, to meet you for this that that really hits home that's awesome 
And and like Madeline, I had an experience last year at AwesomeCon in D.C. where a young man who special needs was there with his dad. And his father brought him because the school did not. And he was 18 years old. And uh, he was nonverbal until he was nine. And that mm-hmm. hit home because one of my nephews is nonverbal. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, right. And that, that hit me right there. So, you know, I'm going back and forth with, with his dad. And we're enjoying a great time. I see him the next day. And I shout him out from across the aisle, right? And I'm like, oh, you know, what, you having fun, buddy? What, what's been what's been the best part of, of the convention for you? And the kid said me. And I'm just like, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like the, the eyelashes are flipping back and forth, trying to contain stuff, right? My heart melting. And, and the thing is, I was at the booth alone. Uh, usually you got a ton of people at the booth helping me out. My wife wasn't there. And I had told her about the young man the day before I got on the phone with one of my sisters and I was, you know, telling them the story about how, how the dad said not to give up and that it, it took a while. And you know, his, his, when his fun and when his son finally started to speak, it was big. It was a huge moment. And I'm just like, Oh my God. So I'm, you know, telling my sister, Oh, don't give up hope and all of that. And then, Next day, the kid comes back and he's like, you know, you're the best part of my day. Uh, I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, and then and then the dad just confirms it. Right. And I'm like, no, come on, man. You know, don't don't stop. And he's like, no, really. And, you know, it's a special needs. If it gives you any bit of attention, it's huge. Right. And and the kid was getting stimulated by by everything. But he kept coming back to engage with me. And I was just like, oh, man, that's. That's it, man. That's 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 it. That that filled the emotional well for for quite a while there. Shoot, it was almost a year now. I'm still talking about it. It's a yeah. great. Moment. Yeah. It's great when you have that. Like yeah. I had a similar experience, but it was a young woman uh-huh. who picked up personal monsters, and one of the things that kind of got my attention was she said, "This made me feel something." I'm like, oh. "What?" And I found out from her father and her that she had just been diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. They were figuring out her meds. Mm-hmm. So it actually kind of made her smile inside. Mm-hmm. And having dealt with certain aspects of that and um, certain times when you are not happy per se, um, you do feel numb and it's not a great feeling. So I've been through those periods of where I felt numb because I couldn't feel any pain anymore. So I get the feel. I could understand that. I am not diagnosed schizophrenic. I have friends that have been diagnosed Mm. and it is a challenge to maintain. It's one of the harder aspects of mental illness and mental conditions that you have to deal with and get that. But it's like, you know, I I have to admit that either people hate my work or they love it. At least it makes them feel something, Mm -hmm. makes you feel alive. And I kind of like that. That's cool. It's, now, it's a big pick me up, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Now, before we continue, I want to share out. This is a terrible segue. <laughs> <laughs> that's the title. I hope that's the title. <laughs> that's not the title. No, that's not the title. Yeah, title is the end of all. Terminus. Um, Jeff, what are we looking at here? Jeff, you you're muted, you're muted. You're muted, Jeff. Yeah, sorry. I was trying to kill the buzz. I totally forgot that I have a uh, fireplace in the background making annoying noises. Anyways, The End of All Terminus is a um, sci-fi action apocalyptic story about um, the universe dying and the last seven species in the universe board the spaceship Terminus and do their best to escape the universe before it all is destroyed. And obviously all seven species don't like each other. Um, There's going to be a lot of death, a lot of destruction. Um, it starts off about 100,000 species, uh, individuals on the ship. It's going to end up with about uh, 12 uh, making it to the end. And so it's sort of like also, um, I guess, um, a great catastrophe of death <laughs> as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, it's a fun story. It's a thoughtful story. Um, each um, species represents a part of our own society. And it's interesting watching them interact with each other. Uh, there's a warrior race. There's a, um, a peaceful like plant-based race. Um, um a technological base race, a uh, group of clones, a religious based society, uh, us humans society. And it's basically, like I said, watching these 
individuals trying to survive as they try to get the hell out of the universe before it all dies. So it, it's a good story. This is the second issue. Uh, this is a one that ramps up the action quite a bit. A lot of aliens um, meet Star Trek in this one. And it leads into the third issue, which is going to be kind of the, a little bit of a backstory of how they all come together. All right, cool. So, uh, uh, of the two issues, how many more issues do you have to go after this? Um, I'm going to end up probably within between 15 to 20. Okay, that's cool. Now, what type of release schedule are you looking at annually? Um, the first couple of issues, um, I think the first three end up being uh, one a year, but hopefully mm -hmm. as people get more invested and they fund a little bit quicker, um, we like to move into um, six months um, intervals for a little while, then try to move to a quicker rate as hopefully popularity increases. But for now, because we are um, working day jobs as we do this, mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. Sorry, um, the artist Brad Ship is an amazing artist. Um, unfortunately, he works a day job, so it's a little slower. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, support your local artists as much as humanly possible. <laughs> gotcha. Now, do you want me to play this video? Sure. I made it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, just give me a <laughs> I swear. Is it not working or? You can do it. <sighs> you can do it. If this is just a dramatic pause before the big beginning. Big dramatic pause. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And like, as we're watching, anyone wants to uh, listening wants to get me to fifty percent today? That'd be fantastic. I want to mind fifty percent of my uh, fourth day. So yeah, let's get me there, please. You're almost there. I'm, I'm getting close. I'm I'm a I'm a couple of purchases away from getting me there. Uh, if they do like the full bundle, it, and it's like a good pricing. Oh. I'm going to be quiet. Jeff, I was going to say, you're going to hit 50% before Calderon learns how to play your video. <laughs> Seriously, like, you know, no, it's my system is acting up. I just have to get a new, I just have to get a new computer. I'm just, I've been fighting it for weeks. <laughs> if not months. Jeez. Usually the time to get a new one when you start fighting it. Like I said, yeah, it, I builds up, it builds up the tension, so I'm, I'm not concerned that the video's not worth the build up. <laughs> <laughs> The Vault Terminus is back with this amped up second issue. Check out these stellar covers from Brad Shit and Dan Price of Bigfoot Nose Karate Band. The second issue sees the crew rock into the planet of darkness, where they become hunted by its ruthless creatures. Do you look at them aliens? These creatures are far more nasty and cunning. Holding a mysterious secret that will haunt the crew for issues to come. New characters appear as head of security Nakano, a badass, no nonsense woman who even drafts his respects. Joining her is the cocky and tough as nails pilot, Orville Yeager. All your favorites are back too, like the Warrior King Thraxis and the Wise Salah. But one of these individuals will not survive until the end. Also returning is President Lamar. Her decision this issue will decide the fate of everyone. On board the terminus. I sincerely hope you back the end of old terminus issue two. This has been a labor of love for both Brad Ship and myself. I think everyone will enjoy this action packed and thought provoking second issue. Please back what you can. Let's get this issue made. Yeah, and like I said, the, the pricing is good. It's um, $9 for um, one issue with $5 for shipping. There's a community indie community bundle of digital PDFs. You can get 25 uh, indie PDFs for $15. Um, there's you can get all six covers for $32, and I think it's $10 for shipping for that one. Um, you can get a digital catch-up for issues one and two for only I think $12 or $13 with I think five or six dollars for shipping. So the prices are I think are reasonable. Everyone can do it. Even if you only have like two dollars, you can get the second issue PDF four dollars for both one and two. So I think the prices are good for everyone in every. Um, economic uh, situation. It's just a question of, um, you know, going in and back in it. But like I said, these are some killer covers. Uh, Dennis Valencia did an awesome cover with uh, Thraxis uh, Killing Some Aliens. Raymond Lee does a Star Wars homage cover. That's a Brad Ship cover. And um, we also have covers from Dan Price from Before Nose Karate and Chris Michael from Crit. So got the, some of the indie community giving it the thumbs up and uh, helping me out here. All right, cool. Listen, it looks really nice. I mean, you got what 20, 
uh, 26 days ago. So you got plenty of time. So, you know, I don't think you'll have any problem funding. Um, I hope not. But if anyone wants to get me to funding today, that's fantastic too. So, you know, oh, I mean, yeah. it's never too soon to, to fulfill your uh, campaign, right? There's yeah. no <laughs> It like I go very, like get it now done. I want to be one of those fuckers that like funds all thirty grand in like five hours. I want to be. Yeah, I, 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 I will say there's. I will say there's a moment. Right. 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 I was say there's never a moment where it's not too soon to get the big pledge. Right. It's just like I, I don't want to be like waiting on day three and sweating over whether or not I'll hit my goal or not. <laughs> right. This yeah. is true. This is true. All right. Now. Um, okay. Cool. I have a now, question. Let's... I have a question for Jeff. I have okay. a question for Jeff. Jeff, um, is your Oralville Jaeger um, character an homage to Chuck Jaeger? Yes, he is. Indeed, he is. Um, every character, believe it or not, is named by uh, someone usually from history. Um, Ada Lamar is based on um, a famous uh, woman from the 1940s or 50s. Came out with the. Um, I think oh, no. Eddie Lamar. Uh, Eddie Lamar. Lamar. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, everyone is that inspired by Lamar. someone from history, and mm -hmm. I'm not, apparently not that original with my own names. <laughs> I just ripped off names for more interesting people. No, it's good. Okay, yeah, that's cool. Um, I have I have to say your your gray tone work, your interior artist is great. Oh, oh, just, Brad Ship is he's awesome. He's fantastic stuff. Yeah, thank keep, you so much. Keep putting it out there. Absolutely. All right, cool, Madeline. Do you want me to play this video? Um, sure. Be my guest. Get the hamster working. I'm no, sure. We I'm have sure. the dramatic pause again. Sweet pause again yeah. Get that hamster rolling. <laughs> you can do it. Oh, we lost them. Oh, oh no, yeah. he's grinding. Oh, I'm to do too much with his computer. He's grinding. He's grinding. Oh, lag. Computer. Computer one, JD and zero. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Come oh, back. Yeah, yeah. Come oh, back. Oh, no. Oh, oh, no. All right. All right. You know what? This is Madeline's time. Until yeah, just, just describe the video. Back. Madeline, talk sure. to us a little bit about the book right now. Sure. Um, what we're doing is doing a print run of volume one as a hardback for the very first time. Okay. And for those of you who are not familiar with the series, it's about an ex-Pinkerton detective, a spirit photographer, and a genius scientist who battles supernatural forces in late 1800s Boston. Uh, we have made five stretch goals, which include uh, 18 digital comics that go to anyone who has pledged for a reward. And uh, the other two are to add on a gray satin bookmark and foil stamping to the hardback. Um, so we're moving along. Okay. Uh, other incentives include limited uh, metal, I would say membership business cards for a special detective in brass, copper, and black stainless steel. Oh, wow. And then a few days ago, we added on a mid campaign add on of our first ever puzzle with the, um, using the cover by Rebecca Isaacs, who she did a beautiful job. And so those are limited as well. Uh, this is, a, overall, this is a slightly higher price point than my other Kickstarters, just because it is a hardback and it is a special edition that's limited. Um, so yeah, we are there. And <laughs> well, you're at twenty two thousand dollars for anybody who uh, is watching and wants to check it out. I just put the link in the chat. Um, it's Thank in the you. show notes, but, you know, you can pull it up right now. Take a look at it. Um, you're at twenty two grand right now. Why a puzzle? Well, one, I haven't seen anyone else do that. OK. And and I mean, obviously, there have been Kickstarters for puzzles. But those were for puzzles. And so this is just, I thought, would be a fun add-on for um, the wonderful nerdy geek set that we all live with. <laughs> and, you know, we all like to do puzzles. Um, yeah. And I and the cover was just so beautiful. I thought it would make a, a good one. Okay. So I so did it. <laughs> I can actually, like, play it if you guys want me to. Yeah, pull it up. Pull okay. it up. I was trying to... I was trying to uh, uh, say it in the respond to you in the private chat, uh, but I'm also okay. trying to coordinate with Calder on the same time. I'm sorry. No, yeah, no, it's up. okay. So, um, yeah, just go ahead and pop that up. I somehow can't do the 
screen. I can share the screen, but I can't put it on the stage yet. Oh, damn. All right. Oh, uh, well, oops. Sorry. I tried. I'm not as excited, Christy. You got us excited for this moment right there. Uh, okay. So, um, this is going to be finishing up in 10 days. You're at 426 backers. You're over 22. Yeah. You're, yeah, you're funded, you know, to the gills. Um, how many stretch goals did you say you hit already on this one? Um, we've made five and we're just, we're homing in on number six. And those stretch goals are not things that people can unlock to pay extra for. That's automatically added into whatever rewards. Correct. People spreading that dollar a little bit more for the common folk like us. I love that. Yeah. Why? Why did you choose to go down this route though with your books? Uh, you mean through Kickstarter? Yeah. Mm. Um. Well, we originally started out uh, self-funding the okay. first three books, mm. and as everyone, yeah. excuse me, I'm dealing with allergies. As everyone knows, making comics is expensive. Uh, so yeah. I actually probably started on the Kickstarter platform in 2014. Okay. Something like that. Um, and it's always been Boston metaphysical, metaphysical society yes. or anything. Yes. Else? We, we have, um, the original six issue mini series. Uh, we do have a volume two, okay. which includes our four standalone sequels and the first two issues of our new series, mystery at Pike's peak. So we actually have a lot of material out um, of which you can get through the Kickstarter, either as di digitally or physical copies, um, along with, you know, a few extra goodies. Okay. And uh, like the novel, there's a prequel novel and a prequel um, anthology uh, and the audio drama that I was talking about earlier. So you wrote um, you the novel get... as well, or did you have somebody else do that for you? Oh, that's me. I wrote everything. Why just Boston Metaphysical Society? This is something I wonder. I and, and I'm I'm not trying to knock you when I ask that question. I just oh. it, it's more you know. Uh, um, oh, it has to do with time. Okay, it's just time. Yeah. Um, uh, this all takes a significant amount of time to do, <clears throat> and it's it's been uh, what I would call reasonably successful. So it's the thing that keeps the machine running. Okay. So okay. Um, I need to keep Boston Metaphysical running. So yes, there are other series and stuff that I want to do um, of my own IP, <clears throat> but I just haven't gotten um, time to do that. Right. Right. No, I get it. Yeah. I get it. Oh, yeah. well, look! Oh, look at who's back all of a sudden. Hey. Hey. Hey, guys. Yeah. Yeah. You want to hear something nice. funny? So my system, I guess there's something running in the background. I was doing something weird. And I'm like, oh, okay. And the, the, the video started playing. And I and I sat through the whole video. And I'm like, where is everybody? Why is nobody talking? Ah, uh, son of a gun. Here, here, here we are. You know, picking up your pieces, baby. Steampunk Supernatural Series, Boston <laughs> Metaphysical Society. Welcome to our Kickstarter to print our first ever Volume 1 Special Edition hardback. If you're not familiar with the series, it's about an ex-Pinkerton detective, a spirit photographer, and a genius scientist who battles supernatural forces in late 1800s Boston. With an amazing cover by Rebecca Isaacs, this limited edition of volume one comes as a hardback and a softback, and not only includes our original six issue miniseries with art by Emily Hugh, but additional pinup art by Carl Allstetter, Jesse Mesa Tobes, and Melissa Pagliuca. We also have some cool weapons designs straight from Granville's lab and a 10 page bonus story with art by MJ Erickson. And there's more. We're doing a limited run of our first ever Boston Metaphysical Society metal membership cards in brass, copper, and black, making you a special protector <laughs> part of the BMS team. The best part is that the volume is in pre-press and should be ready to go to the printer by the end of the campaign. So please, be sure to check out all of our reward tiers and pledge today. Thank you in advance for your support.
Very nice. I like it. I like it. I like it. Look at that. Right. When I could see it, it, it brings <laughs> a certain uh, je ne sais quoi, you know what I mean, yeah. to promoting the, uh, uh, the campaign. Okay, je ne sais quoi, yes. You like very that? Nice. I, I'm very, uh, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the book is giving me the, the pro uh, uh, a vibe. And, and, you know, I just, I wanted to go, you know, French Algerian, you know, I just, I, I wanted to get that accent out there. Okay, so Madeline, please take over. <laughs> um, yeah, you you you've been gone, JD. Um, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> My apologies. Like I mentioned before, we've been um, we've made five uh, stretch goals. Uh, eighteen are uh, we got eighteen digital comics to everyone who pledges. <clears throat> Added some cool things to the hardback. Uh, the Grace Satin bookmark the foil stamping because this cover just screams foil stamping so yeah, that's really i think nice. i was going to do that even if we didn't make it because i just i love the idea of it <clears throat> and that's a cover by rebecca isaacs emily hugh is uh the interior artist and uh mj erickson is doing the uh, bonus 10 page story cool. and uh yeah, we got a lot of stuff. Nice. Now, <laughs> this is this is uh, early on in the year. What are you planning on? What are you planning on doing on later on in the year? Uh, well, that's a good question. <clears throat> uh, my artist for Pikes Peak is currently on a hiatus, and it it really kind of depends on what's going on with her. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so there's there's some decisions to be made which I haven't made yet. Gotcha. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, you said you also wrote this in prose, right? Well, it's yeah. a, all of these are separate stories because I never mm -hmm. repeat a story. Uh, the novel and the, the novel is a prequel that focuses on um, Elizabeth Wellsmore Hunter, who is Samuel Hunter's wife. Mm -hmm. uh, the anthology is a series of short stories and novellas that range in time anywhere from five to 30 years before the first uh, graphic novel begins. Uh, the audio drama, which I also wrote and produced, um, with a terrific crew of Chip Michael and Eddie Louise, and a, a full cast. Uh, that is also an original story that roughly takes place during the time period of volume one. And we are offering that either as a, a CD, uh, a cool credit card like flash drive, or a digital download. Very nice. Very nice. Now, where do you get, like, are these coins? Those are lapel pins. Lapel pins. Oh. That's very nice. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, this it's it's that's for the, the steampunk community loves these. I I have people who've collected these since the very beginning, because certain there's certain ones I will always keep, but there's others that are limited, and mm -hmm. um, when they go away, they go away for good. Gotcha. And that's the flash drive, the little credit card thing. That's that's oh, actually the flash drive. It comes in nice. the little velvet pouch. Oh, very cool. That's the puzzle. And we got the team, Emily, Gloria, Farija, Far Fariza, excuse me. Now, now, where do you find your artists? Where are you, where are you collecting these, uh, your team from? Well, Emily, who did uh, the original six issue miniseries, I met through a friend through school Mm -hmm. And uh, when we finished, uh, Emily went on to Bigger and Better. And so by that time, I'd been in the indie uh, community for, for a few years. <clears throat> so I sent the word out that I was looking for another female artist. And a friend suggested Gwen Tavares. And I was about to reach out to her, and she reached out to me. Uh, I hired her to do some character sketches. She nailed it. And then we worked together for four years. She did our four standalone sequels. Beautiful, beautiful job. Um, mm -hmm. And then she decided to have babies. 
And, you know, she basically has two kids under the age of three. So she had to switch her priorities, which is completely fair. Mm -hmm. And then I did a pretty big search. It took a while because there was a number of artists that I liked, but they were busy until 2025. And mm -hmm. then um, I found Elizabeth and we started talking and then I brought her on board and she's been doing a fabulous job. Elizabeth cool. McKenzie is nice. doing Pike's Peak. Awesome, awesome. Now, um, how many different series? Like, because I know you said you have you have limited series and then you have like an anthology. So, how many different series you're running in the same universe? Well, I it's in prose, graphic novel, and audio drama mm -hmm. uh, form, and those are all different stories. Gotcha. So every everything. Um, relates to one another. It's all they're all standalone, but everything is linked. So uh, when you read it all, it just enriches your experience. Or listen, Very listen nice. and read. Yeah. Yes. Very nice. This has got to get them all. I like it. Very cool. Now, um, how far are you along in the campaign? I know. So yeah, ten, 10 days, days left. Ago, ten, 10 days, days left. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Ten days. You're 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 you yeah, you're doing well. At, yeah. You're doing fantastic. Nice. Yep, we're, we're doing we're, fantastic. She's killing it, bro. What are you talking about? Yeah. yeah that's 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 She's another way of putting it. Yes. Yes. She's kicking ass out there, bro. Good shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We. It's. You know, we've been going through the doldrums, so we've just been plugging along right now, um, which is to be expected. Gotcha. Do you do a lot of uh, live stream promotion for your books when you're live, or I mean, what's your uh, what's your I, process? I tend to I tend I do uh, usually uh, about fifteen to twenty podcasts yeah. while we're live. Uh, okay. This this round has been fewer because. Uh, one, I just I scheduled fewer, and then three canceled on me this past week for um, a wide variety of reasons between health and stuff. Happens. Yeah, yeah it happens. It's it's totally mm -hmm. fair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. No, that's cool. Now, do you find that your your mailing list is your biggest booster in this? Yeah. Or uh, yes. And uh, using a uh, backer kit launch, right? Um, mm -hmm. I highly, highly recommend, particularly if you've run a number of campaigns, the ninety-nine dollars you spent for backer kit launch is money well spent. Yeah. Oh yeah, I agree. Oh yeah, yep. All right, awesome. Right, I you, mean... can, you can use it. You know, you don't have. To, it's not just once. You know, it's before the campaign, during the campaign, all you know, whenever you want, and. Mm -hmm. I tend to space it out depending on, you know, what's going on and how I feel the campaign is doing. Right. All right. Cool. Listen, I, I mean, you know, you're doing incredible. I mean, I don't even, I don't even know what to say. You, you, you as Jay said, you're killing it. So yeah. you just got to keep, just keep at it. So fantastic. Thank you. All right. Now. All right, here we go. Let's see if we can. Okay, here we go, Randy. Oh, here we are. Hey, look at that. What yeah. Kind of window was that? Got it. What? What? No, it was this... it was it was the sites cookies. Oh. Um, yeah. We all love cookies. Yeah. You I can run that. Too much. And the lands of the world were savage and untamed. One man would claim his destiny leaving his Atlantean tribe behind and throwing off the shackles of Lemurian bondage, he sailed the seas as a pirate captain before seizing his place as a king. And now that he has the throne, how long will he be able to keep it? This is the Shadow Kingdom, the classic sword and sorcery tale by Robert E. Howard, adapted by Randy Zimmerman, with artwork by Russ Leach. Available now at FunMyComic.com. FMC, yeah. the Shadow Kingdom. Yep. This is Robert E. Howard's first sword and sorcery tale. It's it's pretty much recognized as the start of the genre. Uh, it's got a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the tropes. 
everybody takes for granted today, including shape-shifting lizard people. So uh, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's the uh, it's Cull just as he becomes king of Lucia, and he's fought his way to get there, and he's he's dealing with being a king, and then he's told about a conspiracy theory to steal his throne from uh, by a shape uh, race of shape-shifting lizard people. So not only does he have to wrap his head around him losing his throne, but that there are all of these monsters and uh, hidden races and things out there that he might not have been aware of before that uh, were supposed to have been chased off centuries before. Very nice. So it's a, it's a great story. If you've ever read Conan, you haven't read this. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is a, this is Howard's first barbarian character. This is not really the prefab Conan, but it's a completely different character. He's a deeper character, uh, a hard thinker, sometimes an overthinker, who ends up uh, learning of this conspiracy and having to wrap uh, his head around it. And at the same time, he meets uh, a he meets a new friend from an uh, opposing race, a Pict named Brule that he is very suspicious of, doesn't trust at all, and then has to come to terms with the fact that Brule is actually there to help him. And uh, there's there's a few times in this story where Cull is sitting there looking and thinking about the situation and trying to wrap his head around it, and all Brule does is elbow him and say, you see that? Just kill it. <laughs> this needs to die. And uh, it, it's it's great intrigue. This is the uh, a faithful... We stayed, we stayed as as, as, faithful, as faithful to. Um, to I'm getting a feedback. We stayed as faith as faithful to the Howard story uh, as possible. It follows it. Uh, in fact, we include the prose story in the back of the book, just so yes. you can compare the comic adaptation to the actual prose work. And if you've never read Howard before, this is this is a great story to start on. He's an incredible writer. And there's a reason all of these Conan comics have come out all of these years and Cull and Solomon Kane and Red Sonja and, and all of those characters, they all start at one point and it's the Shadow Kingdom right here. And this story is in public domain. So Russ is a big fan of uh, John Buscema and John Buscema's Conan. This was a, pro a passion project for him. Uh, we just got to talking while we were on our podcast, and I mentioned that some of the Howard material is officially in public domain. He said, well, find a story. Let's do it. So we found a story, <laughs> at the, and what better one to start with than the first one? And uh, we're doing the Shadow Kingdom. It, it's been really successful for us. The, the Howard fans have been really gracious with uh, the campaign. We're way past our goal, and we're looking at uh, doing more with Cull and Brule in, in regards to original stories um, as, and using this book as a springboard from there. And when we do those, they, they will be called the Atlantean mm -hmm. because Cull eventually becomes king of Atlantis, which was nice. his home tribe. Yeah. Very nice. All right, cool. How long ago did um, Russ approach you? About this time last year. Oh, okay. Nice. Is he done so, with all of the penciling and ink? Oh, everything is done. In fact, oh. Russ won't leave the thing alone. At the, Russ is at the <laughs> point where he's looking at it going, that panel doesn't quite, I think I can, I can, I can fix that. Let me change the perspective on this and boom. You know, he just swapped the page around not, not too long ago. Plus he's done a series of pinups that mm. uh, we don't show here in this campaign that'll probably serve as inspiration for the covers for the Atlantean, uh, depending upon how many more issues we we carry on with this, All right, cool. this story really springs. Uh, uh, there's a whole lot of the, uh, an infinite amount of directions that we can take this story. Can't mm -hmm. wait to get into it. Now, was this the only story in this series that he did, or are there other stories within, I guess, the Cole well section of that universe? He was uh, Howard was a, a pulp writer. He was out selling different stories and he had been working on Cull for a couple of years, taking it off the shelf, refining it, putting it back on the shelf. And he finally sent it into Weird Tales and they took it right off the bat. And and in fact paid him a, a, a as if he was a, a high level professional, but gave him the highest paycheck that he had gotten to that date. So mm -hmm. he sat down, wrote another half a dozen stories and sent those all in. 
cull stories, and they mm -hmm. took one and rejected <laughs> the rest. Got so he's, he sat back and, and worked on a few other characters. Solomon Kane's got a, a it's kind of a Victorian uh, character of his that has a few of the, the elements in it. And then he sat down and, and said, well, okay, you know, uh, the, the, obviously they just want blood. They want action. They want a mindless barbarian. So he created Co uh, Conan and took one of the Cull stories, my favorite Cull story, by the way, which isn't in public domain, called By This Axe I Rule which is a, just a phenomenal, phenomenal. Just a great story. Great story. But he, he, he took that, refashioned it, put Conan in it instead of uh, Cull, cut Brule out of it completely, added an enchanted sword and a large monster and sent that in. And that was the first Conan story ever printed called The Phoenix and the Sword. Gotcha. <laughs> now, how soon before some of those other stories go into public domain? Uh, there's only one other one in public domain uh, at the moment. There's another one that has a ghost of of Cull in it, a Bran MacMorn story. But mm. the other half a dozen or so, he literally put into a chest and forgot about and concentrated on Conan. Mm. And then long after he had passed, when uh, during the 60s, when the paperback boom was, was running and everybody was looking for great prose stories to print, they uncovered that that case and they printed those stories and touched up uh, uh, the remaining fragments of of the cull tales that they had or converted them to Conan stories and and published them then. And th those are the ones that aren't in public domain. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Cool. What do you have left? Uh, we have five days, I think. Five, five days? days to go. Okay. Yep. All right. We're at 172 percent of the goal. We can't, uh, you know, uh, uh, th this is one of those pet projects. I have a bucket list of stuff that I, I want to get done and other issues mm -hmm. that I need to get to and and that. But when Russ asked me to do this, it was just drop everything, and get it done. So nice. I went through and adapted the story for him. Well, Russ went through and did all the artwork for it, then went through and colored it the way that he wanted. He wanted it colored in a, in a uh, very silver age type palette. So it's real, real base colors. It's it's just a beautiful product. And then I got to go through and letter it. And uh, if you're familiar with Howard's prose, there were times that I was really worried I wouldn't be able to fit all the letters in. And I had to go through and fiddle and do editing and that. But I still wanted to keep the the point of Howard's story. With, mm -hmm. the, with comics, you're in a real show, don't tell or tell yeah, show don't tell medium. Right. So there's a lot of the description stuff that I dropped out, but a lot of the prose work, especially when Cull is thinking, because to me, the research that I've done, Cull is about as close to Howard as any of his other characters, because he's deep, he's thinking, he's overthinking, he's always uh, in his, uh, uh, most of the time, it, it's hard for him to get out of his own head. And then when he starts um, fighting something, there's a barbarian lust that just kicks in a bloodlust, and and he just goes berserk, and and uh, you know goes full on barbarian. Mm -hmm. And uh, you you see Cull here as a great great solid character. Cull and Brule both are just phenomenal. They're they're uh, uh, we're the the stories that we're looking at doing after this will be Cull and Brule almost on the road out trying to find the rest of this race of, of uh, ser serpent men and uh, and um, to take them off of the face of the earth, basically, and all of the other prevails that they run into along the way. All right, cool. Listen, it looks great, man. I'm looking forward to it. I, uh, I can't recommend it enough. I'm really proud of this book. Yeah. It's just going to be a lot to. of fun. Yeah. You know, all right. So hold on, I, I got this other thing up here. Where is this? Oh, here we go. Jesus, this thing. Okay, Jay, talk to me. What do we got? <laughs> nothing? You have nothing to say about your book? I'm sorry. I'm, I got excited. I forgot to take this off mute. I started yeah. acting up. Good thing, good thing I didn't take it off of mute yet. Um, <laughs> what you would call it. So we're going to give this another shot, right? Uh, first time I ran this, uh, I was just trying to fit a round hole into a square peg. Wasn't ready. Um, was trying to capitalize on on the momentum we had picked up out of New York Comic Con, but I was promoting a different book instead at that time, and I just pretty much uh, I threw egg on my face. Right, the the, the project exploded on me. Um, so we're going to come back at it right now. We gave it a proper amount of uh, ramp up time, and New York versus the world is my take on the zombie apocalypse in New York City. Um, 15 years after 
the apocalypse happened, uh, they are st- well. Excuse me. When the apocalypse did go down in New York City, they blew the bridges and they flooded the tunnels, so nothing was coming in or out of the city. It took them 15 years to clean up. Once they did, they started to let people in. But now, do you trust the folks that are coming in when they haven't worked on what you worked on, or when they may be carrying a virus or something like that? Right. Um, it's pretty much my take on xenophobia. Right. It's it's build a wall, build a wall, build a wall. But what happens when the people on one side of the wall are trying to keep their family safe and the people on the other side of the wall are looking for a place to keep their family safe? Who's in the wrong with that? The, one of the best things about some of the zombie tales is it was always, you know, a, a mask for something else. There was always an underlying message, right? The very first movie that we saw out there was dealing with racism. Then we were dealing with capitalism. Then we were dealing with communism at one point, right? Um, so why not use the, the zombie theme as a mask to deal with xenophobia? And um, that's as deep as my writing is ever going to get, right? Everything else is <laughs> is, is um, just just knuckle ups and horror and gore and stuff like that. But it's it's an anthology tale. So each issue is a different part of the city and what's going down. So the only main character in the book is New York City. Um, the very first issue deals with, I guess, the immigrants, uh, uh, the refugees coming into uh, Ellis Island, how, how those folks are treated. Then the uh, second issue, we're going to Coney Island and, and what happens over there on the outskirts of the city. And then uh, the, the third issue, which is what we're pitching, uh, takes place with the Brooklyn Bridge being the spotlight element um, and, and how some of the survivors or some of the people that are cleaning up the city uh, or the outskirts of the city react to one another. Um, so I, it's just, it's just fun stuff. <laughs> I mean, if you like, if you like New Yorkers, well, damn it, you can see us try to survive the apocalypse. If you hate New Yorkers, well, damn it, you can see us get eaten up during the apocalypse. It's a win-win. There's something there for everybody. <laughs> All right. Cool. Looking forward to it, bro. Looking forward yes. to it. Oh, and we, I'm sorry. We launch uh, next Saturday, 8 o'clock. You can check out my live stream. We're going to have fun. Uh, we're going to have a trivia contest. Calderon can't wait to be there. Oh, so yeah. what's going to happen is um, on, on the live stream for Saturday night, I've got a few people on the panel, and they are all going to be randomly representing backers throughout the night. So whoever has the most correct answers, wins a few extras in the rewards for the people that have pledged for the project. All right, cool. Yeah. Like I said, look, looking forward to it. All I have to say is whoever I pick, I'm sorry, you're going to lose. Um, <laughs> I'm, just... I'm going to make it with a purpose. You know what I mean? I'm, when I'm in control of that stuff, bang, 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 baby. You know, everybody's a winner in my house. Come on, bro. All right, all right. That's that's fair enough. Real quick, I'm going to post up my campaign. This is uh, Magi's Grace. Uh, when monsters, when uh, the supernatural meets cryptids, you have Magi and Grace's partner, uh, a very angry, upset uh, sorceress, and these are the two people that get brought in whenever they're uh, they have these situations. Like another eleven. This is actually a second chance campaign, so I have a fantastic cover by C. Michael Lanning, another cover by Matt Lunsford. Uh, this is his. He was a former artist on La Blue Girl, something I worked on with him many many moons ago, and like I said. And a fantastic cover by C. Michael Lanning. So we got another 11 days to go. We've already gone by our, um, we've already made the goal, We're hoping to make a, our, our first stretch goal. And we'll, we're going to be giving away a metal, stre- a metal trading card at 2.5, uh, at 2,500. And uh, it'll, ha- it'll feature Mr. Lanning's uh, fantastic cover there. All right, there you go. That's enough about that. It was 11 days ago. Uh, Christy. You're up. What's your question? I mean, for me, I don't have a current campaign running. Um, all I do is do Demon Bitch and some other stories. So uh, I have my link tree up. And essentially, you could catch it on Global Comics, or you can go and subscribe to it on Patreon. Feel free to support that either financially through Patreon or Global Comics. And right now, um, I've been thinking about doing an omnibus, probably the most meteor collection ever of Demon Bitch, since I'm always going to get hit. I'm going to hit six books soon if I do another Kickstarter in the newest edition. So it's like I'm not going to be a prick and say, oh, here's like 
an omnibus of five, but you, since you like, like don't have the fifth one, then you're screwed. It's just like, so people can buy it all at once if they want to. And I've kind of debated whether or not to do hardcover. And then I'm going to do a six graphic novel at the same time. That's kind of the plan right now. At the moment. All right. So cool. don't have a time frame for that. Sorry, but it's right. been thinking the wheels been turning. There you go. Very nice. Now, but since you're the co-co-host, do you have a question for the panel? <laughs> Me? Oh, um. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Don't worry about it. But I'm glad. I'm glad you're the Coco host and not me. <laughs> well, I thought I could help. I don't know. I don't know if I helped out Madeline very much, but at least I tried. Um, I would say, essentially, what do you see? How each of your IPs are evolving in terms of that? I've noticed, like for example, with Madeline, I've seen it go and turn into an audiobook, audio radio. Um, so, are you guys going to go outside the medium of comics like that, or are you going to animate it? What do you plan to do with it? With your IP, All right, cool. people cool. asked you to do different things with it. Very nice, Randy. You're up. I got a lot of different IPs, and I'm wide open for anybody to suggest anything. But uh, at at the moment, I saw Michael Fontaine uh, or Duff Fontaine oh, yeah. in the chat. Says I like uh, Randy's uh, talk on the on the video. We were talking about doing a dramatic reading of the Shadow Kingdom and maybe the other story, the other cult story that's in public domain to do as a um as an add-on but uh um, immediately coming up is an artisan edition i think that we'll be offering with the uh with the work in black and white uh, russ really wants to do that very badly that that's just for the shadow kingdom other than that this the, i got a list i got a bucket list of stuff that i got to get done uh, a history of comics that I'm in the middle of that I absolutely have to get to and finish uh anniverse omnibus that um way back in 1985, Sue Van Camp, if you're familiar with her work at all, she went on to do a lot of magic cards for the some of the early, early sets. The two of us created an um, entire universe of funny animal characters that we both uh, love. And we're getting back up and doing a collection of those, probably an omnibus with some original material. I got second issues of Paragon and Calico and a whole story behind Calico I got to get done. And I just got in touch with Abdul Rashid, the guy who does the... Uh, the Alice in Chains book. I've had this for quite a few years and uh, sent him uh, what we were doing and he's up for another couple issues. So it, it's going to be a crazy couple years for me. I should stay quite busy. Nice. But yeah, other medium. Absolutely. Somebody wants to do a hero bot cartoon. <laughs> come and talk to me. Absolutely. I'll, I'm open for anything. All right. Cool. Jeff. Um, I'm just trying to get my comic books made at this point. <laughs> um, it, it, that's my goal. And at, at the moment, anything else would be gravy. But at the moment, gravy feels like getting my comic books done is, <laughs> is what I'm shooting for. So that's, um, I guess I'm low. Uh, <laughs> my goals are pretty small. <laughs> no, but listen, stay on target, right? Just got to keep working. Yeah. That's it. Before you think of world domination, yeah. think of like running a town first. <laughs> I mean, hey, there you go. Run for an HOA presidency. There you go. My wife absolutely won't let me run for office. She said, I've asked her a couple times and, and I've been asked and she says, no way. So, <laughs> not because I have any skeletons in my closet, but she says, you're too opinionated. Nobody will vote for you. <laughs> That's the way it is. You're Randy the tyrant. Yeah. I'd run that city council, I'm telling you. But anyway. <laughs> Get them potholes filled. Yeah. I'm just nice. kind of laughing. It's like I almost want to say, I answer to no man. <laughs> like on some I forgot which uh which uh fantasy did that. I don't know if it was Lord of the Rings or something, but it's like I answer to no man. It's like that. I think it was like a famous line, but I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think that was at the last movie, uh Return of was it Return yeah. of the King or the one before that, where uh no, it's where I think it was what's her name? Erwan? who Erwin. one of the big bad creatures was like, you can't kill me. No man can kill me. And she says, I oh. am no man. And she oh, takes off. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is this like Eowyn in uh, Return of the King? Yeah, yeah that's Erwin right. That, King, that was yeah. like the best line in the whole movie. Everyone was like cheering at that point. Mm -hmm. And he's the like, came oh, out the damn, Viking house, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Just swamped mm -hmm. with school stuff. Yeah, yeah. All right. Very good. So, Madeline, uh, what are you looking to move uh, your pro your project into? Like, 
Next. Well, I'm I'm actually I I do other projects besides Boston Metaphysical. I do anthologies. I'm doing one for Travis Gibb. I've uh, written a story for Lady Mechanica, which Joe is slowly working on, and mm. <laughs> uh, we'll we'll get there eventually. Um, which is a lot of fun. He he and Marsha were were great to work with. Uh, obviously, I want to get Pike's Peak done. Um, I mean, that script is written. Uh, but a while back, I had started uh, a novel trilogy. I've gotten the first novel done uh, that is takes place 30 years before any of the graphic novels. It, it takes place during uh, the what I call the House Wars, which is the equivalent of the American Civil War. Mm. And there are, like I said, three books in it. Uh, last year, I was about 20,000 words into the second novel when uh, my father passed away. Okay. And I was the executor. So essentially, I just got back to writing about a month ago wow. because there's just yeah. so much to do. And I was traveling yeah. back and forth and taking care of the house. And yeah. Um, Sorry about that. So, and Michael asked what age level is BMS appropriate for? Oh, uh, I always say 10 and above uh, because there's no bodice ripping. There's no hacking of <laughs> heads. Uh, there is violence, there is death, but there's nothing that she probably hasn't seen on TV or a video game. Mm. So yeah, there are some adult themes because I do deal with uh, classism, sexism and racism, but it's more, an organic part of what my characters have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and not like racism is bad, you know, kind of thing. Uh, kind of like, provides, uh, I apologize, just, sorry. Yeah, sorry. It just provides uh, conflict and kind of grounding for the society that the characters live in. So it's kind of like Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, that type of in, that type of environment kind of thing i would think so but i honestly i don't think i've ever read huck finn i've read oh. a lot of other stuff but yeah <laughs> i don't think i've read that oh, okay no i just was wondering but i was thinking it was like on that allegory type of thing it's available in classics illustrated if you want to pick it up yeah get a great uh cliff notes version of it <laughs> i bought a i bought a hardcover version like a nerd all right. Uh, just give me a moment. Uh, Jeff has to step off, has to step out. So Jeff, please let everybody know where they can find you in your work, sir. All right. Um, uh, thank you guys. Everyone it was fun um, look, checking out your senior books. Um, I definitely want to copy the video that Madeline at that level of quality. That was fantastic. Um, anyways, so um, the end of all terminus is on uh, Kickstarter right now. Um, the second issue. Um, I'm also going to be found on Traversing the Stars podcast on YouTube. And you can find me um, all over social media. And thank you again, Michael DeFonte. De De um, always appreciate um, support. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right. All right. Jeff, take it easy. Take, take care, easy. Jeff. Bye, Jeff. <laughs> we lost Jeff. Oh, sorry, um, Jeff. Sorry. <laughs> he had to run. He had to go. Uh, so, Jay, what are you looking to move uh, move your stuff into? <laughs> Oh, man, I'm all over the place with this one, Christy. It's closet. Really, yeah. um, <laughs> we got to move it out of the closet, bro. You know what I mean? We're, we're, uh, we're, we're using it as furniture at this point. I got um, a garage. Yeah. No, um, you know, I've tested my hand. I spent money trying to get a video game made. You can look at it right now on YouTube. Um, I nice. could have used that money to make three books. Um, which went nowhere. So it's, it's a nice, it's, it's a nice looking video. You know, but it could have gotten I could have gotten more credits built out of that. Um, we have put money into action figures, which are going to be coming out, um, and vinyl figures, which are probably going to be coming out before the action figures. Um, that's what I'm doing on my own right now. When it comes to all the other stuff, you know, I, I'm still trying to figure out comic books um, and trying to figure out toys <laughs> to try to figure out how to do anything else. So if anybody wants to come knocking on the door, that's fine. But I'm not a big enough draw yet to have anybody knock on my door. I understand that. Um, 
doesn't mean I can't be ready for it just in case. So, you know, I my all my products are all my IPs are protected, and um, let, let, let's let's see what happens. But for right now, it's it's manage what's on my plate, and it is um, to try to recoup some of the expenses we we uh, invested in getting those toys made, and uh, and just keep making more comic books right now. All right. Yeah, uh, that's cool. That's cool. Um, I don't know for myself. I mean, listen, I'm so I'm so focused. I'm just getting the series finished, uh, and I mean, you know, I got maybe another eighteen hundred pages before I'm done. So it's like, it's it's gonna be a while. But I have the artists uh, working on it, and you know, the only other thing I really wanted there's two things. I want a bronze coin, and I want to do a plush toy. Other than those, and maybe a small figurine, but that, those are the only three why things plush that I really want to do. I think Oswald would be cute as a plush toy. Okay. That's why. Just as a little, maybe four inch or, you know, like four yeah. inch. Okay. You know, I think, yeah. I think with a little bow tie, you know, that a bronze coin and, and maybe a small figurine. Like, I don't know if you guys remember these things. Uh, right? Of course. Oh, yeah. Thank yeah. yeah. So, you know, I love this style and I'm dying to get them like this. And this would be life size for him. So, you know, there, yeah. there'll be, this would be one for one scale. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is he a field, <laughs> field mouse or what is he? Uh, I always figured him as a dormouse. I, I never, I never really like, you know, he's, he's a magic, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a wizard. I don't know what the hell he is. Dormouse are unbelievably cute. And then they yeah. said, oh, the Romans used to eat those. I'm like, now you made me upset. <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, yeah, they used to eat them a lot. Oh, Wait, like eat them alive? Place. No, no he eat, eat them alive. alive. Oh, I thought you said eat them alive. I'm sorry. I'm like, oh. just eat them alive. You know, like street food. Eat them a lot. Okay. It's like buffalo wings. Yeah. yeah. I'm with it. I'm with it. I mean, normally, I'm not that sentimental, but they've got the Get the right animal. sauce. You're good. Yeah. Listen, if I can eat rabbit, it's not that much of a stretch from there, right? Yeah. Well, I hate bunnies anyway, but there you go. You can have. <laughs> But you hate bunnies personally, or you hate the taste? I hate of bunnies personally. They die too easily as pets. Uh, like we tried God. everything to like. I had a friend in 4-H. She taught us how to raise rabbits, and they don't make it. There's a reason why those fuckers run around and have sex with everything, and breed a lot. It's quantity, not quality. Very frail. Yeah, they. Frail. Yeah, it. Trust me. I understand that reference. <laughs> hey, JD. <laughs> JD, uh, DM Ray, I'm not signed in, so I can't answer him. Uh, DM Ray had asked how many pre-launch followers um, I had, and I it's about uh, 380. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Good. But wow. I started like a month ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I would recommend that you start at least a month ahead of time. Yeah. yeah don't do like some of us who just launch and then launch and then launch again. I mean, like you. It's, yeah. Well, you know, like I said, like some of us don't, you know, yeah. <laughs> listen to the I, professional. And here I thought I was being lame doing it two or three months in advance. And I'm like, I thought I was like, I not enough time. I, I think no, we started our, our campaign about three or four months in advance. Russ uh, started a, a mailing list. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. But listen, I will never argue with that. That is a smart way to do it. Mm hmm. You know, I'm I'm um Madeline brought this up before, but I'm loving that backer kit pre launch, uh, not pre launch, um, um, yeah, the launch, launch, yeah, backer yeah, kit I, launch. I, that, yeah, I love it. You know, the stats alone on that drive me bananas though, um, mm -hmm. because I, I am nowhere near uh, where I feel I need to be, uh, with my re ups. You know, I only get about maybe. 20 to 30 percent of the people coming back mm. um in my lifetime of, of campaigns and i'm like how do i grab them you know uh, gotta keep working at it. yeah yeah mm -hmm. all right so i i got a, i got a couple of uh i got a couple of uh softball for everybody um so here's one. Uh, what is the series? What is the comic series or book that drove you to make better comics? You know what? 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 What is? What is the series that, that you're looking to either aspire to or just or just makes you just like you know what that? Yeah, I, I want to try to live up to that on some level. You know, Randy, what are your thoughts? I think it all depends on the project that I'm I'm working on. There's so much 
great stuff out there. Uh, the, right off the bat, I, I did a video a few years ago about the books I'm really thankful for. But right off the bat, I would say Manhunter by Walt Simonson and Archie Goodwin. Just top-notch superhero stuff. And long before all these heroes ended up getting rebooted and re-re-rebooted, uh, Archie took a, a World War II 1940s character and updated it to the 70s and, and did a phenomenal job with it. Just a just a, a, a great, great series. Kirby's Imagination on the Fourth World stuff, New Gods, Forever People, uh, Mr. Miracle, all comes to mind. There are just so many, so many really good things. Horror stuff. You look at the eeries and creepies and uh, the swamp things. Funny animal material. Anniverse is really sprung off of Carl Barks and uh, the, the, du the duck books or the duck work that he did that hardly anybody wants to talk about anymore. Just great adventure material. Uh, there, there's so much great stuff out there and, and it's all inspirational. I, that, that's why I do the podcast on Friday morning and, and mm -hmm. Sunday morning. We pull this stuff out in order to take a look at it. Some, some of it, like the, the book we went through today, I hadn't looked in for like 25, 30 years. It's sitting on a shelf and that stuff's just phenomenal layouts. And, and uh, we, we, we look at the artwork and the story and, and all of that. There, there's just so much great material out there. You can't, you know, nail it down to a specific, but the, the manhunter for me is, is a, a big one. Uh, that was very impressionable upon my youth um, and the Kirby material. I remember sitting at home and, and having the neighbors walk up, what are you reading? And then you got to try to describe new guides to them. Good luck. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Too Just true. so much, so much good material out there. All right, cool. Cool. Madeline, where are you from? Um, I came to comics very late in life, and I was never a superhero fan. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in fact, I didn't even know there was any other comics other than superhero comics mm -hmm. until I adapted Boston Metaphysical into a comic and went back to school and started reading all this indie material and was kind of pissed off that no one had told me that this had existed before because these were like great stories. And this was this is <laughs> what I was interested in, not the superhero stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I have to say, I one of them, um, Jeff Lemire's Ascender and Descender, uh, has was mm -hmm. great on on many levels. Uh, but I also like, uh, you know, Lady Killer from Dark Horse. That's one of my faves. Um, and particularly the attention to detail with the Felix the Cat and the Sunbeam, you know, uh, clock and the Sunbeam. Uh, blender in the background um yeah appreciate all those nuances uh you know why the last man i mean there's 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 a bunch of them so all right cool uh, christy what are your thoughts well um for me i kind of got into underground comics because it didn't it's not that the standards weren't good it was like i just didn't have to be held to a certain level of rules i realized like what i'm really heavily influenced by i mean i looked at all sorts of comics i would look at maggie and jigs i'd look at all sorts of things like oh what's this weird freaking comic oh let me read it and i kind of blame my mom because she was trying to low-key trying to get me into an ivy league school because we lived near stanford at the time and um so obviously she said oh and i said oh i'm gonna look at the books because it was a little bookworm and then i picked up matt granning's life in hell and well that screwed everything up for me so um you know, these observations. So it's like as a kid in fifth grade, having all the hell books, we called them. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of at this point now where it's like I kind of learned to follow my own rules, which is interesting because sometimes can people can use that as a cop out. Like I can just do shitty, stupid things and not be held to any standard. But I what I liked about life in hell is that made observations and it was kind of a smart ass thing like I did. Um I also feel that there were other books that I kind of like studied and copied as a kid. Like I would remember things from Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns and like look at the pictures at the time. Obviously, this is pre-internet and just copy them and study like how they did the composition. A lot of comics that I liked, I would go and, you know, study the composition, copy the characters and all that. And mind you, people, if you come back and go and shit on me about this, I was a kid and I was doing studies. So shut the hell up. That's actually a legitimate thing. And, um, but I, I, I think it's just like, sort of like I delve into my own psyche and just like 
sometimes it's just go like i'll just have a go moment and just do the comic or i'll come up with some ideas jot them down there is no direct formula that i do it's just i just go do it and with demon bitch it's sort of like interesting because they're just one shot punch in the face things um there's other stories that i've worked on they i haven't mentally pulled the trigger yet on them it has to be a go for me like they say in Ag agony and ecstasy you know where michelangelo had to just go and he just did it all in one thing it wasn't like he super planned it out i mean he had it he mapped it out but it was just like go 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 i haven't got if i have a have it with a idea or a thing that's what i've learned to do and that's when it's turned out to be the most successful with people and in general in terms of wit and personal liking and personal satisfaction to public satisfaction but for me it's like i i don't know if i can really hold to my standard because to be honest i'm kind of doing my own thing and somehow that works for me and people really like that because i would get held back a lot by people saying like oh you shouldn't do this you shouldn't do that you shouldn't do this and there is a difference and i am aware of that but just for me it's just go 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 do your own thing and that seems to work the best for me and again i'm not crapping on anybody that works for any of anybody else or the big companies or something it's just demon bitch i found my thing and i would say a lot of that has the primogenitor of matte grading in terms of delivery now that i'm looking at it and i really think about it mm -hmm. the majority part at least that's what i'm focused on but you know i was focused on anime i was focused on other things so i think i don't know if it's like a personal journey but it's like there are times and maybe johnny ryan is kind of my inspiration on this like I just sit there and it's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't write about that. And it's like, oh, it turns out like I should have. That's what he was quoted at once. So I'm kind of going like, you know, if I draw it and I'm like, holy shit, I don't know. But then I put it out and it's really good. And it's not like, oh, I'm just doing it to be mean. It's just like people really resonate with it. People think it's funny. People comment like, dude, I went through this, you know, shit like this. Or I just, or what I've been told is like, you say the shit everybody wants to say, but no one has the courage to say it. So it's like, Okay, I'll take that as a win. Mm -hmm. So, um, and again, it, I'm not trying to sound arrogant to say that. It's just that that's just how it's worked out for me. And I guess I've kind of hold myself to my own set of self standards, although I've given up entirely on self criticizing myself because I never found that helpful. And maybe that's what's made me unable to do that. So I'm kind of using as art as my own personal journey to shit. And yeah and Vic Du says demon bitch is great despite the thrift store thrift store bikini <laughs> like yeah she's pretty nasty but yeah that's all i'm saying is, is that i guess maybe i i was kind of thinking about this early on the show while i was listening to everybody else but it's kind of like now i get trent reznor of nine inch nails why it was popular it wasn't because oh he had a great sound or something but it was i've heard this from a friend of friend a long time ago back in the day when he re released downward spiral and pretty hate machine but it kind of hits me now because it's like it because i'm sort of living it and again i'm not saying i'm like trent Reznor. i'm not trying to say i'm like anybody but they said his people like his music because it's absolutely no bullshit, mm -hmm. and it's kind of there and it's interesting because that journey into that almost destroyed him like he had to have rehab stints he got into hard drugs and somehow i have a good thing of self-preservation to know that you know christy and hard drugs would probably not be a good combination probably would come out really really horrible because I have that darker side in myself, which I can contain and manage and do work well with in what I'm doing now, but I don't think I could do it. Like if I had to be messed up on some sort of substance, it's like, I barely drink anyway because of my condition, but you know, I, I don't know. It's like, for me, this is kind of a personal journey. It's more of a spiritual journey, I guess, if one wants to say that, because it's funny because I write the most pissed off book ever, but people feel absolved while walking from me like a church confession. So I don't know even though my people tell me I'm demon bitch. So I kind of laugh into that irony too. All right, fair enough. Yeah. Jay, what, what are your inspirations, sir? Well, I'm the mark here. Um, you know, I, I, I grew up reading superhero comic books. Um, I loved the Captain America run with Mark Greenwell and Kieran Dreyer. Um, that was, that was <laughs> it for me. That was, that informed, you know, one of the main titles that I write. Um, but then, uh, I found uh, Matt Wagner's Mage, and it found a way to incorporate so many different mythologies. You know, you had, you had the bad guy who came from this mythology, and you had the sidekick who came from this one, and you had the main character who was inspired by this one, but in love 
uh, he was in love with with uh, a character from another mythology. But you know, it, it just oh, okay, cool. It blended all those elements together. Um, That's a but, property in desperate need of a reprinting. Yo, big time, dude! It I got really all my is, originals. Yeah, man. Way yeah, past you. Yeah, I got all my originals. Um, and but then a few months ago, I found a book that made me feel like I was a kid again. And people had been talking about it, and I was like, yeah, whatever. Um, and I'm at a comic book shop in the mall with my wife and my mom, mm -hmm. and I got to kill time while I'm holding their bags and they're doing the Christmas shopping. And I picked up the trade of do a power bomb. And I felt like a kid. I read the entire trade while I was sitting down in the mall waiting for mom to finish shopping. Right. <laughs> so that, that triggered the nostalgia in there for a moment. Um, but the guy took the absurd. He doubled down on the absurd, but put it in, in, in a, I guess a plausible narrative, right? Mm -hmm. uh, made it made it work for what it was. Um, kept me engaged and made me fucking cry on the last page, like a kid. Um, and and again, I was in the mall. I couldn't put it down. I was rushing to read it because I'm like, oh my god, I got to finish this book before my wife and my mom finish the Christmas shopping for the family. You know, and it it just felt like I was a kid again reading this. And here I am, you know, my in my forties doing this, and and it and it just it struck me just being such an entertaining story. Um, again, what he used to build it, but how it made me feel, what it brought me back to. Um, not specifically reading that stuff because it never never came out again. You know, I'm, uh, a, uh, the devil hosting an intergalactic wrestling match with you know a father and daughter. What? Um, uh, but it just fucking worked for the story it was, but it just it made me feel like I was a young man again reading comic books and I couldn't wait to finish it and 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 there you go. I want to achieve that feeling mm -hmm. in the books that I'm making. You know, I don't mm -hmm. want it to feel like just like oh this is money well spent, but it's also bringing you back to a time where you know what maybe you're reading on the dining room table. And it's distracting you for a few minutes from everything that's going around you. Right. That's the goal. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Daniel Warren Johnson doing great work. He is, dude. I dude, yeah. I'm picking up the Transformers. I don't know why. I don't mm -hmm. like the Transformers, but <laughs> it's got me carrying them over, bro. Yeah. I mm -hmm. saw yeah. a fucking awesome statue of Nemesis Prime because I went to Little Tokyo earlier today. And they had all these like model things and model kits from Berserk to um, Transformers to Iron Man, to everything with Japanese style models. And Nemesis Prime must have been like two feet tall. Let me tell you, I am I'm not the Transformer fan, but I got a cousin who is, and um, the dude spent top dollar buying all the Japanese import real metal stuff. He's, mm. uh, and if you're familiar with Transformers, there's this one called uh, the Constructicons, Devastator. Yeah. It's a bunch of heavy machinery. It, 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 it's a three-foot-tall metal robot in his office. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, how much did you spend on it? It's like two car payments, you know? I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, Michael, I can do better than that. I'll send J.D. a picture of it. There you go. <laughs> I took a picture of it today because that fucker is awesome. <laughs> That's there cool. you go, Nemesis Prime in all his glory. And I, yes, I am a Transformers fan. Optimus is yeah. my favorite hero. So I sent it. I messaged you, JD. It, it's like that Nemesis Prime was tits. It was awesome. It was like three feet. I think that was probably diecast metal by the looks of it. All right, all right. Yeah. So Chrissy, this is why I don't like Transformers because they dropped the ball with Ultra Magnus and Rodimus Prime. They should have been the combo, not Rodimus Prime carrying a trailer, even though he's a hot rod car. You know, well, they had to make him stodgy and old, so he had they had to make him into a fucking RV. That was like annoying stupid. as shit. Stupid. He should have just he rolled right all the Ultra Magnus, who was the car transport vehicle. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that here's the thing. Okay, he they take a young guy and he matures into a leader. I'm all for that trope. Yes. But they made him fucking apologize for the rest of the G2 show. show. And like, I can't be ever the leader. I'm like, okay, I understand if you're stepping into the shoes of somebody bigger than you. 
but holy shit, stop whinging about it every yeah. five fucking minutes when you're alone. I understand it was a kid show and they had to show the inner conflict and growth. But after I'm like, God, dude, what the hell? You're carrying the Matrix. Like, stop. Why the, did they uh, choose you? The Netflix, the Netflix uh, reboot that went three seasons was pretty good. Yeah, I heard that was good. Like, I haven't gotten around. Give it a to shot. Give it a yeah. shot. You, you're gonna like it. Yeah, I mean, wasn't it? Wasn't that the one written by Brandon Easton? He's busy. Yes, Brandon wrote. Yeah, Brandon he's wrote good. on season one. That's that's. He he's the one that got me in on it, and I was like, bro, the fuck. Yeah, great Brandon and I have like have met several times. He's really cool. Brandon's really cool awesome. Guy. Awesome guy. Man. Really nice guy too. On top yeah. of that, he's a nice guy. So, but yeah, like I sent you the Nemesis Prime. It's fucking awesome. You got to show Michael that man. Yeah, because come on, give him a give <laughs> give Michael a view because he's backed like Jeff and Madeline. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, owe yeah, it to him. yeah. You have to owe it to him. You owe it to him. You owe it to him, Calderon. <laughs> yep, gotta post it. <laughs> gotta post it. Yes, I, I got it. It's yeah, coming. gotta it's show coming. it on here. Show <laughs> it to him. <laughs> You see, when the smartest pe- one on the panel today says so you got to post it, you got to listen to the lady, bro. Come on, put it up, put it up, Hamel. It's the quickie. It, it's the quickie. coming. It's coming. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. oh, lag. Yes, go that's, to that's my problem. Yeah. Go to Newegg and get a new rig. Oh, I love Newegg. I endorse them fully. Oh yeah, yeah. That's actually what that that's the next step. You know, you know, at your previous job, you pretty, you pretty much could have walked out with one, but you could have walked out with a brand new one. I probably could have walked out with this. You're such a web head. You're such a web I mean, that's yeah. like great for us artists. Like, it's like, oh, shit, I don't have this much money. I only have so much money. Oh, wait, there's new egg. I'll just buy a gaming rig. And like, there you go. There's my thing with multiple monitors all. And like all the inputs and memory and everything. I don't have to think about everything. Mm-hmm. It's like I remember the time when Pentiums came out, and it's like that was kind of straightforward to like know about. And then now it's there's so many architectures and bridges. I'm like, holy shit, this is a whole new system. I can't think about this. Mm-hmm. That's when I started to feel age a little bit. <laughs> All right. Yeah. But yeah. Jay, uh, we're, do we're me a waiting. favor. We're waiting. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Get a shot, screen. Man. Yeah, it's not happening. That's all I'm saying. Not happening. Okay. <laughs> it's not happening. All right. <clears throat> so let, let's uh, let, let's bring the show. We're 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 at the uh, almost at the two hour mark. So yeah. Madeline, where can they find you and your work? Please. Right now, uh, we're on Kickstarter for ten more days. Just type in Boston Metaphysical or or hit one of the links you put up, and it'll be right there. Otherwise, you can find me on my website, Boston Metaphysical Society, or Queen of Mercia. It's the same thing. Uh, that's my corporate overlord name. Um, <laughs> and I'm on Facebook, Boston Metaphysical Society, uh, Twitter, M. Holly Rosing, or what used to be Twitter, uh, and Blue Sky. I don't even know how to, you would say Blue Sky. Just type in my name. You'll find it. <laughs> there's, it's, it's it's become a job. You know, it's another job. There's, too yeah. Many. Yes. 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 there's just Way too many. many. Yep. All right, Randy, you want to let people know where they can find you because Calderon seems to be. It, it's, just okay. look for me on Facebook. Screw everybody else. Screw, screw the rest of the pro- platforms. <clears throat> you know, I'm on X too, but that's kind of uh, just where the you know where the trolls are. <clears throat> I like Facebook. I can just post memes and talk about my stuff and maybe share some some of my stuff. And it, you'll you'll find me there, Randy Zimmerman. You'll know it's my. Uh, my page by the drawings that are that are up there. Other than that, the Indie Comics Network. I do two shows: Friday morning comics by night, five a.m. Eastern time, so that I can catch Russ and and Glenn just after brunch over there in England. We talk about and show off the stuff that really inspires us and that we love. Also, Sunday Funnies at nine a.m. on Sundays. Same thing, only a little bit more otter uh, material. Like that, uh, the book we went through today was. Uh, I don't have it, but oh, there it is. There it is. We went through a uh, future day, which is an odd book of uh, Gene Day short stories, and very few people in the in the market are familiar with uh, Gene Day, and they ought to be. It's some absolutely phenomenal stuff. But other than that, uh, look for me at arrowcomics.store, where I have a lot of my stuff. But most importantly, Shadow Kingdom over at fundmycomic.com, the Shadow Kingdom. And I want to thank, if that person is out there, uh, I noticed that we got an uh, additional backer 
since nice. we've been on the air and I want to thank them if they're out there. Thank you very much for, uh, for backing that project. We are really hoping to get uh, 200 backers at least by the time this campaign's done. It's so only five days left to go and it's going to be a great, great book. I can't stress that enough. It's just a classic, <clears throat> classic story and a lot of fun. Nice. So other than that, before we go, I want to mention two things we, we missed uh, and, and, I haven't seen this enough in the media. We There were two great, passionate comic book people that passed, not counting uh, Ed Piscor, that, that tragedy. Mark Bright passed earlier, and you might not be familiar with that name, but if you've been collecting comics as long as the, the at least the three of us have, Rom, Transformers, G.I. Joe, he was there, you know, and he was a genuine workhorse in this industry, he, he passed, I believe, within the last week. And Bob Beerbaum, who was a very passionate retailer who was right there at the start of the direct market and, in fact, was working on a history book about the direct market. He had more information than most anybody, well, pretty much everybody else in the market, especially when it came to the origins of the direct market. And it's very sad to see him pass before that work got out there because it's it's an important part of this art form's history is the the formation of the direct market and both of those people will be sorely missed and their their contributions were great to this industry mm -hmm. so they're very passionate about this art form and uh you know mm -hmm. sorry to see them leave okay well, yeah <clears throat> sorry to end on a downer but uh, yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's okay that's my sorry. daily <laughs> where can they find you? <laughs> well, I'm found everywhere on all social media that I could possibly find spreading my shit at Horror Tour Studios. <laughs> I'm also found on Facebook at Christy Shin. So you can probably see me. If you see my fucking mug up there, then that's me. <laughs> um, and number two, if it says something like about like peace and love and some stupid bullshit, then you found a clone. That happened once and my friends all trashed it. Um, <laughs> well, that's funny. <laughs> Oh yeah, like it's a it showed my face. Somebody cloned it and somebody tried to catfish as me. And then it said oh put, it put like the generic stuff around said like peace and love. And I'm like, I, and they said, That's not you. As I said, No, it's not me. Go ahead and fuck with them. Okay. <laughs> and so they went ahead and messed with them. Good so idea. Great. That must By have been the way, fun. Do, uh, online harassment guys, just the catfishers, they're assholes. Uh number oh, yeah. two, um, yeah, and so number two, Madeline will be on my show, the draw stream on this network, indie comics network for lunch hour Wednesdays noon Pacific Standard Time so check that out and I've also put my star in there and um, you could just check me out on Global Comics and Patreon and Webtoon if you want to go ahead and take a look at the whole demon bitch thing if you want to order anything order from my store um, I sign the books personally and I will ship them to you personally I'll probably write something awful nice. in them but yeah prints and everything I have all this stuff in like art. I am doing uh, Chatsworth block party at with Julio Galvez over at the We Can Be Heroes. That's up on my Facebook. But I also will be in Calgary Expo in Canada. Yes. Um, I'll probably be cold and not hopefully not dying because I'm from California and I can't deal with that inclement weather. And I'll be up there. Don Wynn will be also up there and we will be up in Calgary Expo. So chances are I probably won't die. But when, when is that? Yeah. That is uh, Calgary Expo. Let me take a look. Give me a moment. Ah, hate having a few monitors. So Calgary Expo will be on the 25th to the 28th, and it will be at Stampede Park. Uh, Chatsworth Block. I'm a guest there, and Chatsworth Block, Chatsworth Block Fest is on the 13th. So I'm glad I got my fucking taxes done way ahead of time, so I don't need to think about that. And that is from Penn to yeah. yep. near um, near We Can Be Heroes. It's kind of like weird because it's JD on left us again. in Chatsworth at Eton and DeSoto. So go ahead and download the graphic on my Facebook. It is open to the public. Okay. Awesome. And check out Madeline down below. I will be releasing copy for that pretty soon. Cool. Thanks. You can find me at unstoppablecomics.com. All of my social media links are on that website, unstoppablecomics.com. And you could find Jose Calderon. Um here on Indie Comics Explained. You can catch him on his Kickstarter, which has a few more days left with Magi's Grace. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And thank you, panel, for uh, sharing your projects with us and sharing your experience with everybody who's been watching. Thank you yeah, yeah. for yeah, thank having you. us on. 
Yeah. Really appreciate it. It's good. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, Calderon gets a new computer by next week. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good idea. I, I, you know, if, if anybody in the Midwest, if you're around uh, the Kalamazoo area, I'll be at the Grand Rapids Con in Kalamazoo this uh, next weekend. So swing by. I'll be moderating some panels and having some fun selling some Arrow comics. So nice. if you stop by, I'll give you a free comic. Way to be. Okay. All right, everybody. Good night. Take Nine. care, everyone. We can't end Nine. the show until JD comes back. So we yeah. might as well just keep talking. I'm going. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, you know what, Chris, Thank you me. have uh, you have access to the panel. I thought I did, but apparently now I don't because I didn't log in the best way. I, ever I think we're on it. JD's uh, um, uh, StreamYard anyway, and not the main Indie Comics Network, or I'd be able to get back there too. Yeah, yeah I don't yeah. have access yeah. to it either. Wow, this has been one hell of a night, folks. Let me tell. You. JD, if you're out there, you're going to have to get back into the room in order to end the show. So please yeah. come back. Yeah. Come back. Come back. Come back. Come come back. back. Oh, my God. I feel, I feel like this has been a bad Muppets episode. You know what I mean? Let me actually try going in another way. Let me leave the studio uh, and go back um, in because I did it through the StreamYard link he gave me. So let me just see if I can go in another way. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, he said, just great. leave. Hold on. This is, this is, just leave. Just leave? Funny. Okay. And now he just Chris, says, just done. leave. Just leave. Just leave. Right. Way to be. Way to be, Calderon. All right, guys and gals. Thank We're you, still everybody. counting okay. here. Have a good night. Take good care, night. everybody. Bye-bye. See you soon. And I guess I'll go, too. Take care, everyone. Shadow Kingdom. Fundmycomic.com. Hashtag always be promoting. Later. <laughs>